So Dave, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. I'm here in one of your buildings. It's called the Yellow Box. Technically, God's building. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, God's building. We're in one of God's buildings, yes. which is all the buildings, I guess. Yes. But one of the one of the buildings God has allowed your church to use. True. <laughs> okay. So tell me a little bit about, we're here in Chicago. Tell me about your church, what you've been doing, and how you've been doing stuff in this city. Um, me and my brother, I was just married. So Sue was in on this, and then um, like four friends from college, we all decided we wanted to plant a church. We decided to move to the Chicago area, mm. and we picked Naperville, which is a west suburb, as our first yeah. location, and um, God's been very, very kind ever since. So you just, how long ago was that? 33 years ago. 33 years. Yeah. And so like, not that numbers are everything, but they do mean something. Yeah. Um, what was like a Sunday attendance, like maybe in these last few weeks? Oh, less, um, around 5,000. 5,000 people come together. And then you guys have been really connected to church planting yep. around the country, around the world, built events and all kinds of things. Talk a little bit about how you got into the church planting thing. Well, when, when we were first planting the church, and we had kind of this threefold vision, we wanted to be phase one, an impact church. We wanted to really make an impact in this community, mm. the kind of thing where if, you know, if some reason the church would go away, our church would go away, the community would go like, no, we really need this mm. church. That was kind of phase one. Then we said yeah. phase two, we wanted to be a, a reproducing church. We actually, I remember sketching that on a little napkin. We were at breakfast, the, the four of us. And we primarily thought of that in terms of church planning, but it ultimately also ended up including some multi-site stuff. Mm. And then phase three, and probably because of the kind of church I grew up in, we said we would love for it to be a movement. Mm. So it. So we had that in mind from the very beginning, mm. but we didn't actually plan a church for the first nine years in the life of the community. Okay, wait, wait. So I know it's so, so pathetic. So, so, no, it's not. No, it is pathetic. That's not what I was going to say. Well, I what think I it's pathetic. Gonna, what I was going to say is you have those three things <laughs> yes. before the church is even really growing. Oh, yeah. We're, we're sitting in, a, this is like prehistoric times, in a hen house <laughs> restaurant in Bloomington, Illinois. Um, cause we were my, wow. one of my friends worked there. So we met him there and we're going, okay, let's figure this thing out now, you know? Yeah. And yeah, so that was kind of the, here's the, th and actually it's, it's pretty amazing because those three things have kind of served as a, um, as kind of s steps in what we've tried to do along the way and mm -hmm. kind of God's let us do that. So that's unusual. Not every leader that goes to start a church thinks that big, that fast. So why do you think, like, how do you make sense of that? Like most pastors are like, if I could just have a church, that would be amazing. How, how, did, how, did, how did that, what, what happened to you that makes you um, that person? Okay, yeah, what, that's the right question. What happened to you instead of, <laughs> instead of what's wrong with you? Yeah, no. no, it's almost like you got. I think, it, I think, I think it's a combination. I think it's a combination. Honestly, I think there is there was some some arrogance. Okay, I sure. think that's mixed in there. I think secondly is some gifting, mm. and I think also there's some things that came you know and from growing up. So mm. yeah, I think I was probably we we thought we could do anything, mm. so we were way slightly too cocky, we'll say. Right. Secondly, I think I do have kind of an apostolic entrepreneurial gift that kind of makes you see in the future. Right. Because even when I decided to plant a church, um, I remember being in college when I made that commitment in my head, that's what I ought to do. I was, it just made sense to me. Well, why would you plant one? If you really want to make a difference in lots of people's life, I'm going to plant a church that plants churches. Yeah. Now, probably the, the other part that may be more nurture is my dad was a church planter. Ah. And I actually grew up in something called the Christian church, independent yeah. Christian church. And they kind of like the vineyard movement, mm -hmm. they refer to themselves as the restoration movement. Yeah. So there was something, I think, in me that kind of always, at least in the language, mm -hmm. that felt like the church was supposed to be a movement. Mm -hmm. And so we were audacious enough to go like, you know what, if we get to pick anything, man, God, we'd love to be yeah. see, see a movement come out of this. And if we're going to start, let's make that what we want to do, Yeah. which is remarkable. And then, of course, you have all kinds of different things you've led out of that. So you've been so gracious in training and connection with new thing and then with exponential talk about what some of those elements are what you do yeah so you know nine years into in the community we did finally plant our first church it actually was our youth, a youth pastor came to me 
and said, hey, I want to do what you did. And mm -hmm. I was like, did what? And he's like, plant a church. And the truth, truth was I wanted him to be the youth pastor for my kids. Mm. And so I was kind of thinking like, well, maybe no. another staff member? Yeah, yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> right. But eventually, yeah, they ended up um, planting a church and uh, out near the Denver area. Mm. And we sent about 35 folks uh, that quit their jobs, um, sold their homes, transferred schools, moved from mm. Chicago out there. Mm. And that became the first church. Then the next year was Southern California, then New York, then Boston, then Detroit, Knoxville. And as one would wow. do, we, we would all get together because we were friends. And sure. we, so we named it. We just called it New Thing. Mm. Isaiah 43. So I don't know where a new thing that worked. Mm. And um, fast forward now, what it's been 16, 17 years, and we're in 47 countries. And God's been um, hopefully different than when we planned the church. I hope this is not arrogance. <laughs> yes. I mean, I do. I, I, I feel like yeah. God has been extraordinarily kind. Yeah. Extraordinarily kind. And that we're getting to plant churches, so many churches, so many different places. Then, the, seven then there's the exponential part. And right. so that's a new thing. I wear a couple different hats. Yeah. Community Christian Church, new thing. And then exponential. Exponential is we convene church planters. Mm. And you got to come and speak. I did. Yeah. You were the only guy who got a standing ovation. <laughs> come on. There we go. And uh, seriously, he did. And uh, uh, But we convene church planters. Yeah. Um, and really try to really just challenge them yeah. and encourage them with the ideas of reproduction and multiplication. You know, what, what I find so familiar in what you're describing is many of the things you're describing mirror our vineyard story, right? So yeah. we have some folks that are gathering to worship and pray. There's the Jesus movement happening in Southern California. It's all these sort of hippie types are coming to Christ, movement of the spirit. There really wasn't like a plan to like do all the things, but then some folks start planting churches nearby then around the country, then around the world. Yeah. So that movement language, like you said, is familiar to us. And so I know uh, we've talked a little bit on the side about how you've seen the vineyard have been connected. And you talk, talk a little bit about where you have bumped into the vineyard along the way. Yeah, I've always, I mean, I've kind of always been a fan of the vineyard, well, certainly of John Wimber. I find, yeah. find him so fascinating for so mm -hmm. many reasons. And even when I was in, in college before we planted a church, where you can kind of just, you know, you weren't a pastor, so you could kind of pick whatever church yeah. you went to. And I didn't go to, I, I went to a Christian church, Bible college, right. but whenever I could, I would like go to a vineyard church. Mm. Just quite frankly, they were more interesting. <laughs> you didn't know exactly <laughs> right. what was going to happen. Right. It was like, totally. Yeah. And, um, and even when we moved to Naperville, before we planted here, there was a vineyard here in, in, in Naperville. So mm. we would kind of go over there when we weren't, you know, trying to raise money other places and right. stuff. And um, You weren't trying to raise money at the vineyard. The vineyard Church never gave me any money. <laughs> Not yet. We, we, Not yet. <laughs> we, we generally don't. So, yeah, that would make sense. But so you you just have a fascination because I imagine some of the things that were already in your heart are in our heart. Oh, yeah. Multiplication and, you know, evangelism and how, some of the discipleship ways that you're talking sound really similar. But then you, you had told me a funny thing about John Wimber. I think this is worth saying that you had a, was it a skit? You had a play? You had a... We actually, here at Community, this has been a number of years ago, we, we produced a three-act um, play. Um, golly, I can't remember the name of it, but basically there were three characters. Yep. One was Jim Elliott, okay, and Jim Elliott was a missionary to yep. Central America? I think so, yeah. Okay, who's kind of renowned. Yep. Uh, there was also was John Wesley, yep. who of course started the whole Methodist movement. And then there was John Wimber. <laughs> and, as, and the set, <laughs> this is gonna sound like a joke, was the three of them all end up meeting in a bar, and they have this fascinating conversation. I, and I'll I tell you, I can get you. I can get it's you. It's not this. a joke. It's, it's not, not a joke. This oh, sounds it was like a, a joke. It sounds like a punchline. And part of it is at community, our the way we kind of encourage discipleship is through mm -hmm. three connections: connection with God, connection with uh, the church, connection with the world. Mm -hmm. And we really saw. I think it was we saw like Wimber this connection with God, and mm -hmm. I think in Wesley we saw the connection with the church. Okay, because yeah. community, he yeah. has such a strong influence yeah. in community. And then um, with, um, who's the Elliot. third one? Elliot. Jim Elliot was the connection, you know, the mission for the yeah. world. And so we kind of felt like each of those kind of embodied those. Mm -hmm. And if they could just have a conversation about the things they were passionate about, we could teach our, our church. So great. Yeah, we, we, could, we <laughs> could make a short film. We could? Yeah. <laughs> That's so great. Okay, so again, we have so many things that yeah. mirror, and you've been doing a lot of 
wonderful things with exponential new thing, really your church, helping the vineyard as we're thinking about how do we move towards more multiplication? And you use that word very intentionally. Like when you say multiplication, you mean it as different from addition. You mean it different from a lot of other ways that people think about evangelism or church planting. So why do you think that word multiplication is so important or even exponential? I mean, you, the words you're using are important words. Yeah. New thing turns out not as much, uh, but, but the other, yeah. I mean, it's Isaiah, I guess, but, 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 but talk a little bit about how you see churches that plant churches. Like what's the mentality that that requires? How do you get those things into your heart as a pastor or a leader I mean, because that isn't the way everybody thinks, obviously. No, I, I, I think I think the, the the paradigm that you need to have, I think, is the paradigm of, of, of church as movement. Mm. So I think one of the last things Jesus said before he leaves, you know, planet Earth, he, mm. he says, "Hey, we're going to start here in Jerusalem, and then go to Judea, and then Samaria, and then the ends of the earth." Mm. And I, and he was talking about the church, and I think what you whether you look at that geographically or socioeconomically or ethnically, whatever, whatever, however you look at that, mm. he's talking about it starting here and going to here, going to here, going to here. He's talking about the church as movement. Mm. And I think sometimes we end up with a form of church that we have now because we haven't started with the end game. We haven't started with the dream that Jesus had for his church, that his church would be a movement. And I think if you start with movement, it, it, it causes you to think differently. It causes mm. a different mental model in your head for what the church is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And so when you start with movement, then I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you, you are going to think about multiplication. You are going to think exponential. How do, how do we make that happen? As opposed to what is it people are thinking instead? Like if they're not thinking that, yeah. they're thinking place to hang out and be together, it's a place to sort of raise my kids. I mean, what, what are they thinking that isn't? Yeah, I, 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 do, I think. Like what do you think you're dislodging by saying, think about the church as a movement? Let's try something else on side. I'll, I'll, I heard the question. I'm going to answer it a little different way. Yeah, sure. I think most church leaders, church leaders, wake up every day um, asking a good but not great question. Mm. And I think the question they wake up going like, is, "How do I grow my church?" Mm -hmm. And it's a good question because healthy things grow. But but when you focus on how do I grow my church. You're going, to do, you're going to do certain things, you're going to do certain tasks, and you're going to get certain outcomes. Mm -hmm. I think when you really wrestle with like Acts 1-8, when you really wrestle with Matthew 28, when you really get look at what Paul when talks about in 2 Timothy 2-2, um, I think then you begin to shift the question, and I think a far better question, a mm -hmm. far better question, and I, I really challenge leaders to do this, ask this question, instead of how do I grow my church, is how do we, okay, mm -hmm. multiply God's kingdom? Because if you ask that question, it, it, it leads you to different practices yeah. than it does if you're just trying to grow your church. Because mm. if, if I'm just trying to grow my church, then it's kind of like, okay, how do I tweak my social media marketing? How do I change the banner on the outside? How do I, you know, tighten up the service mm. and do a little better job in Kids City? And you go from, you know, 100 to 125 this year. Yeah. But when you begin to ask the question, how do we multiply yeah. God's kingdom? All of a sudden, we're let's say we're two pastors in town. It's like it's we. How are we going to do this together? Yeah. We got a whole community, a whole state, a whole country. Mm -hmm. How do we and together? And you're talking about how can we multiply? How do we plant a new church? But not just plant a church, but also invest in them the DNA. So they're going to plant a church, that plants a church, that plants a church, and then we're going to keep doing that over and over again. Yeah. And the and the win when it's me and you, it's you know it, it 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 it's 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 not Jay's church, it's not Dave Dave's church, it's not my castle. Yeah but it's God's kingdom that wins. Mm -hmm. And so I think, particularly in the West, particularly in the West, in Australia and Europe and the United States, I think we have a preoccupation with how, and it's a good question. That's the problem right. almost with it. It's a good right. question. It's just not a great question. How do I grow my church instead of how do we mm -hmm. multiply God's kingdom? And that'll get, you, that'll get you to movement, which is what Jesus wanted. It does. And what I, what I appreciate about you, and I've again, gotten to spend some time with you and watch you speak in different environments, it seems like part of what you, you're asking for us to do is to dream a little differently. To dream bigger. Right, right. And not just a little bigger. A not lot. just that you would have a bigger dream for you, but how do you get God's dream 
Yes. For a city, for a nation, for even a movement. Right. So talk more about that because, you know, you have, you have great stuff you've written. You wrote a book called Hero Maker, which I think everybody should read, which really gets you into sort of thinking about multiplying disciples. But the reason you get driven to those kind of practices is because you get a big enough dream. Yeah. So how do you push people to dream more as pastors? Because frankly, you know, we came out of COVID, about everybody wanted to quit. Um, we, yeah, that was hard. We, it was really hard. Well, and we're in a moment in the vineyard where a lot of our churches, people are trying to figure out they're towards maybe the end of their career. They're going, you know, gosh, I'm, I, I feel like I've done my bit. I'm trying to figure out how to hand this to somebody else. How do you, how do you stir pastors and leaders to dream? Well, I mean, maybe I'll, I can tell a quick story. Yeah. Um, I remember after we planted the church, like, again, to, my dream, <laughs> okay, for my church right. was how could I get to a thousand people? Right. And that seemed like the biggest, best, oh, amazing right. thing ever. Right. right. Yeah. And maybe I could talk well enough. Right. Maybe I could organize a hundred small groups well enough. That'll right. get us to a thousand. And I remember the guy in the workshop I was in, he says, he says, he says, take your current dream. Take a current dream for your church. And I'm going, okay, a thousand people. Yeah. This is going to be good. <laughs> and then he says, multiply it by a million. And so you go, and so I'm going, I'm doing the math. A thousand times a million. I don't even know. Okay. A lot. It's a billion. <laughs> it's a lot, right. <laughs> it's a lot. So a billion. And then, then, then he says this, now I want you to make that, figure out how to make that dream come true. Mm. And there was something about that exercise. when he, when he I, So I started going, oh, a billion. At that point, I knew I mm. couldn't, communicate well enough to hold, you know, a room with a billion people. Right. I knew I couldn't organize enough small groups to get to a billion people. To even start moving that direction, mm. I knew I was going to have to work through lots of other people. I was going to have to make your dream come true. I was going to have to make your dream come true. I was going to have to, you know, invest and disciple this person and release them yeah. and invest and disciple this person, release them over and over, do that. I was going to have to work outside of even my own little denomination with other groups in order to get something that big. And there's something... There's something about mm. um, forcing yourself to dream bigger that that forces you to th um, to a place where you're where, where you're more dependent on God. Mm. And and I I always challenge leader it, leaders if you don't have a dream that makes you dependent on God, then you need to get a bigger dream. And there and there's something about having that bigger dream that then forces you. It's much more in alignment with movement. I mean, I actually, I mean. Yeah. There's, what, 8 billion people on the planet? I mean, so a billion is a lot closer to what Jesus was talking about than yeah. a thousand. Yeah. And so, for, and I'm not sure that, that works for everybody. Well, it definitely makes you start thinking. But I do, I do, and maybe you need to pare it back and just go like, hey, take what you're currently trying to do and multiply yeah. it times 10. Yeah, but what I find great about what you said yeah. is, and, and you do a great job of this in The Hero Maker, is you said what I immediately realized is, I have to work through people. Absolutely. So this isn't just trying to get people to do my dream. But now I'm asking, I wonder what all the dreams are of the people around me. Oh, yeah. That God's giving them. And it's part of my job to work in them. Yeah. So describe more of that because that's not a small move. Like, you know, when we're, especially when we feel pressed, like we're against the wall. We have to make sure we make a budget. We have to figure out what it means to... There seems to be a lot of logistic stuff on the table, and we're trying to get, I mean, often you'll even hear pastors talk about, well, we're recruiting volunteers so that we can have our kids' ministry. Yeah. We're recruiting volunteers so that we can have the worship team, the blah, blah, blah. We need to recruit donors so that we can fill in the blank yeah. or for our mission strategy. You're saying something that's like inverted. You're saying, no, you have a big dream, but you're also looking for dreams. You're trying to elevate people within that. And, and there's also, I think there's an element of faith in this. Mm -hmm. there's, I think the element of faith is that if, if God put, what, Ephesians 2.10, a good work that he prepared in advance mm -hmm. for you to do and for every person to do, then I think we have to trust that. Mm -hmm. then, that if I help you discover your dream and empower you and equip you and release you to fulfill that dream, We'll have enough kids workers. Mm. We'll have enough people to pass out programs. We'll have enough people to run tech. We'll have all the people we need if we do that. I think I think there is a matter of faith about that. Yeah, there is. And not only that, but that's how you also that's how you get to movement. Mm. 
because you're constantly, you're looking at all the people that are sitting in your chairs or in your pews or whatever, and you're going like, what's the good work God prepared in advance for him to do? I, 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 had, a, I, had, a, I, had, a, I had a mentor, he would, he'd always say this. He said, my fruit grows on other people's trees. Mm. And, I, and I think that, you know, talked about being a hero maker. Instead of trying to be the hero, you're going, no, my job is to make heroes of other people. Mm. You know, the word, and he would also say this too, we're, we're, the, um, we're the platform, not the show. We're the platform, not the show. But I do love that, you know, uh, my fruit grows on other people's trees. Oh, that's incredible. And again, if you get to a certain size, you get a certain level of success or notoriety or whatever, much like you said, like the worst thing that could happen to you if you're not in that workshop is you do get a church of a thousand. Right. <laughs> and then you're like, I'm serious. I, I, feel, I feel like I talk to so many like church planners who, and part of my job is just to go like, dude, you, do, you have no idea what you could do if you just spend the next 30 years yeah. planting church. I mean, because some of them are like going like, I mean, they, I mean they're kind of like, they've kind of got their eye. And it's kind of too bad we're in this big auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Because this is not the dream. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's cool, I guess, but that's, this is not the, this is not yeah. the dream. Um, the, the dream isn't to get on a platform that has... <laughs> Smoking slice. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Yeah, amen. All right. No, I mean the dream is how do I constantly release other people? So I, I'm, I'm like, I'm much. I mean, if if I look over my shoulder at what what God's how God's used me, I'm much more excited um, about the churches we've been able to help start and and the churches they've been able to start and the, and the networks or the fact that I was just in Australia and, mm -hmm. and there's a, a young woman there named Amanda who's opened up that whole region. We're gonna plant hundreds of churches there. I mean, that's, and, and they're gonna be mostly small, mostly really small right. churches that are gonna help lots of people find their way back to God. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, and I mean, this, this is, we use this, this is great, yes. but this is not the dream. Yeah, so give me a couple, like Amanda, give me, give me stories, give me a few stories of how you've watched people think move from addition to multiplication, whether it's even in your own church or maybe as you have pastors coming toward you, because you're helping us do that in the vineyard, right? Yeah. Like we have little networks of training that we've been working with new thing. And then of course we bring people to exponential because the stuff that we see God putting in your heart, we want in our heart. And frankly, I think is sort of the genesis of who we are in the vineyard. Oh yeah, it's in you. It is so in you. That's why I love working with you guys. Yeah, so so, but we we we're just learning so much from you and getting a lot of good coaching. So, give us a few examples. I mean, give us some of the things you've watched as far as dreams, either through a church or a nation that you're like, hey, this is inspiring. This is something you guys could think about. Um, um, there's, there's a uh, one of my one of my best friends is a guy named Troy. Uh, Troy was a guy who's in. He was in. He was my small group apprentice, and not only did um, eventually he became the small group leader. And so then, wait, so pause there because oh, sorry. for your world, yes, everybody's apprenticing. Like when in your church, yes, you're like, hey, you're whatever you are. Yeah, part of the thing we're asking you to do is apprentice. Yes. Yeah. So you just use that really casually because you're like, oh yeah, that's what. No, don't be sorry. sorry. It, it's a good sign. No. It's like it's so second nature for you. You're like, oh yeah. If I'm leading a small group, I have an apprentice. Yeah, and, and maybe even to back up a little bit, at the core of every movement is is, is some multiplication catalyst. Mm. And in this case, it's I think I think I think for the church, it's apprenticeship, which is just another way for another word for disciple making. Yeah. And so, like I said, so I was leading the group, and Troy was my apprentice, and I was training him. And after about six months, I mean, he was. He had it down. So I just turned the group over to him and I went and started another group. And he took an apprentice mm -hmm. and he reproduced that. And eventually he started coaching small groups. Mm. And he was working for General Mills. And um, when we got ready to actually start multiple locations, I went to Troy and I was like, dude, you're the best leader we got. Yeah, You need to quit General Mills. He was kind of a golden boy. Mm -hmm. And you need to come be our community pastor. Mm. And he, so, he, so he did. And so he did it. And then not only... Did that, and then he actually apprenticed other community pastors, and we started other locations out of those locations. Mm. Um, he came to me probably ten years into it, something like that, and said, "Hey, I think I want to go plant a church in Kansas City." And again, it's it's the same kind of thing. You're kind of like, "Oh crap," because he's yeah, your I'm friend. Lose people, yeah. Yeah, totally. but it was totally in him. He grew up out there, 
And so we sent about 25 people from Chicago with him out there and a bunch mm -hmm. of money. He planted a church and he's been out there, you know, more than, I, I was out there for their 10 year anniversary, mm -hmm. which was fun. Mm -hmm. you, you kind of feel you're like a, you're like a dad with your yeah. kids. And, and um, they'd started three different networks and helped plant 40 churches during those 10 years with Windows. Wow. So, I mean, I'm way, yeah, I'm way more proud. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> I love that. That's incredible. Yeah. And it starts with a small group apprentice. Yeah, everybody <laughs> has an apprentice. Yeah, it if we could, down I mean, here. and again, let's keep it real. It doesn't. Everybody doesn't do <laughs> no, it here. Not everybody becomes. No, unfortunately, no. no. But right. but maybe the good news is, I mean, like we helped new thing. We helped plant over nine thousand churches last year, and and everybody isn't getting it right. I wish they right. would. Right. <laughs> but that but the apprenticeship piece, whether you're mm. a small group leader, whether you're a ministry team leader, whether you're a pastor mm. and you have an apprentice, someone you're training who's going to go plant a church, yeah. whether you're a network leader, because we're working to help the vineyard have networks now, yeah. that you also have an apprentice. I mean, you want an apprenticeship at every level. That's how you get the movement. Yeah. So talk about that. So you, for us, yeah, we have a whole chunk of our churches that are going to go through a succession mm -hmm. plan. Um, a lot of our pastors are seeing the end is closer than the beginning. It's probably the nicest way of saying it. Yeah. And they're trying to figure out, okay, how do I get our church into the hands of the next leader or the next group of leaders? And if they haven't been in this kind of thing, um, it can feel like, man, this is so daunting. How do I, how do I take a first step? Like, like I'm sure you talk to people all the time. They're like, well, we don't really have a prince. We have classes, and then we have like a training thing, and that's how we try to build leaders. But you're saying, no, you have to intentionally choose people to be apprentices. Yeah. What do you think are like first steps, next steps? How do people start a culture of apprentice making if they're not sure how? So are we starting like at a small group level or at a pastor level? All levels. Well, I mean, like... First you just got to say so it, last, I guess. last night I was at my small group and my apprentice leader is a guy named Michael Park. And part of the reason I picked Michael is because I like him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have an affinity for the people who have totally. leaders or totally. they have leadership gifts because yes. I think I do. Um, so, and I think he does. And I think, I think there's a lot of potential in that guy, mm -hmm. a lot, a lot more than he even realizes. Mm -hmm. Um, but mostly I, if, like in a, like with my, um, small group, I pick somebody I like. Right. Yeah. And I think that they could eventually lead that group. Right. Yeah. So I, I think that's okay. Cause these are people you're hanging out with now. Um, when it gets, if you're talking about like someone you're apprenticing to be a pastor, yeah. well, you're probably also, again, I would pick someone I like, <laughs> but I'd also Right. You're looking for probably a, a, a gift set, um, some potential there, yeah. um, even some proven faithfulness. Yeah. Going like, okay, this person has done these things that are real value in our church. Yes. They got a track record. People already see them yes. making a difference. Uh, they bought into our philosophy of ministry. They bought into our yes. vision. They all demonstrated those kind of things. things. Yes. But what I, what I'm aware of listening to you is the reason you can apprentice a pastor is because a whole lot of other people have been apprenticing people. Yeah. So when, when a cult, there's a culture of this, then as a pastor, as a senior leader, you're watching people being developed yeah. and you can sort of notice like that person's kind of unusual. Yeah. In other words, the whole church is taking on sort of the work of apprenticing. Oh, yeah. Such that people then are sort of serve, they're rising in a way you can notice them like. Oh, I can notice this person because they've led, like you said, Troy led a bunch of different small groups. Right. And he was uh, this. Oh, well, maybe he could do that. But if the if the whole church isn't taking that on, and it's just the job of the pastor somehow to develop it, and we have a lot of programs running. We've got a class, and we've got a training thing, and we've got, but we aren't doing this kind of work. It's difficult to identify those leaders. It's if not impossible to watch them sort of rising from the bottom, which because they're probably not. Yeah, well, or they, I don't know, they just get picked because there's a need. Yeah. It's kind of desperate. Like, right. I don't know, we need somebody to, like, right. pour the coffee. I mean, we please pour some coffee? You know, and, then, <laughs> and somebody just out of, like, I don't know, I like the church. I guess I'll, I guess I'd help out kindergartners. You're going to make me? I don't know. I, I like kids. You know, that's a very different. <laughs> yes. It's a different way of recruiting leadership and then saying, Will you apprentice with me? I see something in you. Right. I'm doing this thing. I think we're making a difference in these kids' lives and come along with me. Okay, so so it's building a culture of apprentices. I've already talked about your book more than once now, but Hero Maker. But 
Talk to me about like when you look at a movement, like so you're also interacting with movements and denominational leaders. And you're what, what are you seeing God doing by way of creating multiplication, like across the world? In church planning? Yeah. I think there's, I think there's some really exciting things happening. One is, um, let's, let's just, we'll just focus on the church in the West. Yeah. I, I think, and I'd, I'd love to know what your thoughts are too. Um, I think we're seeing the church form in, in multiple expressions now mm-hmm. where I think we've had kind of what I would typically call kind of a launch large kind of church planning right. model. Um, I think increasingly we see, yeah, you have mega, which is mm-hmm. a launch. I just call that as a launch large, but you also have micro. Uh, I see, I was, I was just in Australia. Uh, there's a woman there named Bree Mills who's doing mm-hmm. great work. Mm-hmm. in micro churches there. She's identified, I think, 350 micro churches out of the 11,000 mm-hmm. churches in Australia there um, and helping train up more. Um, we're doing some things here at Community post-COVID mm-hmm. now, really focused on micro churches, which would be fun yeah. to talk about. Yeah. Um, and I think also, I think, so there's, you have mega, or maybe a better word, maybe let's call it macro. Let's macro? do that instead of, instead of because that's because mega feels like a 2,000 plus church. Right. So you got macro, which is yeah. bigger, bigger, micro, yeah. which is smaller. Yeah. And then I think meta, so there's mm. a lot of cool things happening with mm. with digital and online and VR yeah. and that kind of stuff, and I'm really excited about that mm. too. That's really interesting. Yeah, that is like two hours of conversation. Yeah, I guess we'll just have to keep talking. But uh, but and so as we wrap up, okay. here's what I love. I'd love for you to say, what would you want to say to the vineyard as a whole? Vineyard pastors, as they think about church planting, multiplication, you get a chance. You got your shot to just say, here's what I want to say to you, Vineyard. All right, how many minutes do I got? <laughs> <laughs> as many as you want. Yeah, right. no. um, one is don't forget you're a movement. Mm. Don't forget you're a movement and, yeah. and behave like that. Mm. Um, two, Hold on to your simple ecclesiology. Mm -hmm. You have a really simple, fluid, flexible way where lots of different kinds of churches. Mm -hmm. I mean, some denominations, some groups. I mean, no, you got to do it this way. That's not true in the vineyard, which is a great thing for movement. So remember your movement. Hang on to your simple ecclesiology. Everybody get an apprentice. I mean, it's just, it's again, it's disciple making. It's what Jesus told us to do. He's like, no, here's how we're going to, you know, ends of the earth, make disciples. So at every level, ha- have an mm-hmm. apprentice. Um, here, maybe We haven't talked much about this one, but I would tell every pastor, you need to be in a network. Mm-hmm. The same way, the same way that probably most of us tell all of our people, you you need to be in a small group. Right. Because that's, that's the relationships of the catalyst for growth. Pastors, you need to be in a network. One is there's some homework on this one. It, it, it'll get you, get you through what you're going through. You're going through a lot of hard stuff. You're still reeling post-COVID. It'll get you through it. Mm. But particularly if you convene around this theme of church planting, yeah. you'll also plant a bunch of, you'll plant significantly more churches together. Mm. We, got, we got data to show that significantly more churches together than, than you will if you're kind of waiting until your youth pastor finally nine years later comes up to you and says, hey, I want to do what you do, <laughs> right? Right. That's why you need to be in a network. Yeah. So, um, I think that's what I'd say. Yeah. Don't forget your movement. Yeah. Uh, don't hang on to your simple ecclesiology. Yeah. Get an apprentice and join a network. That's really good. And that those feel doable. That's oh, yeah. That's also good about that. <laughs> yeah. Those feel like things you can, you can do. And I, I'm so grateful for your investment in us. I cannot tell you how grateful I am, how much we've enjoyed some of the network training you've given us. Because some of this language, I think may have been intuitive to us in different ways, mm-hmm. but we've not necessarily known how to implement different things. And it, it all different kinds of churches in our movement are learning how to be in networks, either locally or amongst other vineyards. Because you're right, that creates that multiplication. Okay, I have one last question for sure. you. What, you give me a couple Bible verses you really like. You like Acts 1A. <laughs> you think? You, you like Isaiah, apparently. The new thing. You like, we proof text that. One, but, <laughs> yes, <laughs> not as strong. <laughs> but what 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 else do you like, man? These are scriptures that kind of keep me in the middle of what I'm doing when I think about 
pastoring, multiplication. What are ones that you are kind of like touch points for you? Um, I'll get, I mean, two comes to mind. One I already mentioned, Ephesians 2.10. Mm-hmm. That is so exciting that there's a good work that God prepared in advance. Yeah. One for me, that's just cool to think like, wow, there's yeah. something really important God put me on this earth to do. Yeah, I love that. That gets you out of bed in the morning. Yeah. But also, when you sit across the table from somebody, you're looking at somebody going like, hold it, there's something, there's something partic- in there. Yeah, that's I mean, right. I, I love that. And mm-hmm. then when you look at a whole crowd of people going, it's not just me, it's all of them. And how do you yeah. release that potential? That's good. That's one. Um, and I think, I would say, boy, there was about two years going through COVID, and now it's not quite every day, but all, but every day going through, through COVID, I mean, I would write out James 1, 5. Mm. And go, okay, God, give me wisdom. Yeah. Because it was hard. It was, I mean, it was really, really yeah. hard. Yeah. And, um, and so um, that, that was one for me, just going, okay, God, mm. I, I, need, I, need them, I need some deeper understanding. I need your insight. I need your Holy Spirit's prompting me. Mm. Um, I need your wisdom. Yeah. I have a verse when I think about you, when I pray for you. Really? What is it? Unto him who is able to do more than we can ever ask or imagine. Yeah, I mean, I do, I do feel like some of the stuff I've gotten to do, and I have a pretty big imagination, is like, yeah, it was just God being super, super kind and gracious and immeasurably more. Yeah, I'm grateful for your humility and you're willing to lead and serve and that you are working hard to not make it about you. Yeah, thanks. This has been great. Would, would you be willing to pray for us? Would you pray for all the people? Oh, yeah. You're talking to. Yeah, love to. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, and, um, and we, ask, um, we ask that um, the, the things that, that Jay and I talked about, maybe there's something very specific, uh, very specific that you want to just bring to mind right now. Mm-hmm. That's uh, for that person, that's for that leader, that's for that pastor or church planner that's listening in. Mm-hmm. Uh, or Lord, maybe maybe also there, there's something that you're bringing to mind for someone you're sitting next to, that um, or you're sitting near to, that, that uh, a word of encouragement or um, that kind of exhortation for them. Lord, I ask that you just bring those to mind. Father, I, wanna, I just want to say thanks. Thanks for what you're doing all across the country and really even around the world through, through the vineyard. Uh, the tremendous influence that they've had in the United States and, and even when I travel to other parts of the world. Lord, I ask that um, you continue to help this movement move. Mm-hmm. I ask you, you, you really do something special through what, what's beginning to happen again through church planning. We ask that we just we begin to see churches multiply and multiply and multiply. Yeah. And Father, um, we promise to give you all the credit. We promise to give you all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.